Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast on the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Rolf Jacobson. I'm Catherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. And this is the podcast for October 1st, uh, 2023. And it is part of our series that we're suggesting uh, four Sundays on the power of names and naming. And here we get the ultimate name. We get the revelation of God's name to Moses. And there's other things going on with names in this story too. But we tell the story of the Old Testament in hop, skips, leaps, and bounds. And here we go. We're going all the way from Genesis 32, uh, way up to the story of the Exodus. And so the one thing to fill in for the folks is how we got down to Egypt. Uh, so uh, last week, Jacob returns to the promised land from um, where he had been with Laban. And now they get down there, of course, through the whole Joseph story. And and especially in order to, to understand the first verse of the passage that we have in Exodus 1, um, you're going to need to explain to them who Joseph was and how they got down to Egypt. I appreciate needing to tell the story of Joseph because the first line that we will enter into in this text is, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And I want to ask, how do you not know Joseph? Um, how, how does the leader of the most powerful empire of that time not know his own history? Because Joseph is the reason that Egypt is Egypt, because um, the, the earlier king listened to Joseph when Joseph was given the vision of uh, a, a, a time of plenty followed by a time of famine. And um, in not knowing his own people's story, the story of his own nation, and therefore not knowing the story of Joseph, um, this this king, he reacts by setting his people against one another. He decides to deal shrewdly with the very people who are responsible for them being the powerful nation that they are. And in setting up this oppression for them, we very quickly move into where the Egyptians follow the lead of their king, and they begin to dread the people, uh, the Israelites. And uh, it's very interesting because as ruthless as they are to them, God keeps blessing God's people. Um, so because they don't know their own story, because they don't know Israel's story, they don't know God's story because Israel is going to increase because that's the promise of God that was given to Abraham and Sarah. And so this king is actually going against God, even though he doesn't know God. And I would say if you play around with that in any way, you might want to just remind folks, this is the reason we tell this story, so that we don't get to power and not know the best story ever told. Yeah, thanks, Joy. Yeah, I, I, it, it's helpful to link this story back to that promise to Abraham, uh, back to Genesis 18, where we're talking about, you know, Abraham and Sarah finally being blessed with a son. Uh, here's where the promise of Abraham comes to fulfillment. So we saw it somewhat in the story of Jacob, right, where he has the 12 sons and the, at least one daughter, right? And, and through Jacob's wrestling with Laban and uh, Rachel and Leah's wrestling with each other, they, uh, that promise to Abraham begins to be fulfilled. But here's where we see it really fulfilled in that uh, the descendants of Abraham are, are a great nation. And not just the promise to Abraham, but the, the command of God back in Genesis 1, uh, in verse uh, Exodus 1, 7, it says, but the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong. Those those words fruitful and multiply obviously should ring a bell uh, back from Genesis 1, right? Be fruitful and multiply. So they're fulfilling not just the promise to Abraham, uh, but also uh, uh, the command of God to be fruitful and multiply. The, they're fulfilling the command to uh, to live uh, and to uh, and to 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 um, be fruitful. Uh, 
Uh, and Pharaoh is acting against that, right? Pharaoh is the death, the angel of death, really, here, even before the story of Passover. Pharaoh is himself the angel of death, working working against God's will for life, uh, for the whole world, and particularly for Israel. You know, the names, uh, the names here are interesting in, uh, and part of it, um, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh is not named. And uh, from the point of Old Testament historians, then they, of course, they want to know which Pharaoh could this be? And there's, is this Ramses the second or whatever? Uh, 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 Walter Brueggemann, our friend's uh, joke always is, you met one Pharaoh, you met them all. <laughs> so he's, uh, but, and that's true about dictators, but the, more importantly, Pharaoh doesn't have a name. And so, um, and Shifra and Pua do, and their story does not uh, play. Uh, you can add that story if you want or tell it. Shifra and Pua have names. Uh, Moses has a sister. We found out. We find out her name later, and then God reveals God's name later uh, in the second part of the story, uh, chapter three, one through fifteen. And I really think that's um, an important part of this story that uh, to land on is the power of the name and the call of Moses. Um, now, we, this is a, a very controversial thing. Uh, but first of all, before we jump to the name, other, uh, I didn't mean to cut either of you off if you wanted to say anything else about chapter one. Uh, no, I don't want to say anything more about chapter one, but b before we get to the revelation, or the, the divine name revealed, I just want to note one thing in chapter three, uh, starting in verse 7. Um, so Moses turns aside to see the, this burning bush, and the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the gospel, uh, or at least a, 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 a pre, a, a foretaste of the gospel, right? God says, I've observed, I've heard, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to bring them up to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, right? God hears, God observes, God knows their suffering, God comes down. Here's the gospel, right? God comes down to bring Thank them you. up. And can't we say that the gospel is the good news that has always been God's plan, that the gospel is not a 2,000-year-old idea? It's, the, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This has been God loving the world from the time that humanity, you know, took that first prohibition and, 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 and went with it. Um, God promised them. And God kept that promise. God created them a good world and God kept it. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to shy away from calling this the gospel. I think it's a All consistent right. story from the very beginning. Yeah, amen. It is, it is the Easter moment of the Old Testament in the sense that in the New Testament, God is the one who raised Jesus from the dead. And in the Old Testament, God is the one who brought Israel out of the land of slavery out of the yeah. land of Egypt. And yeah. so it is absolutely the gospel. Absolutely. So there are things to, uh, to uh, note in this story. Uh, one is uh, it is characteristic. Most of the true prophets in the old Testament um, uh, uh, have excuses and demure uh, uh, when God calls them. Uh, Moses takes it to the best level because he does it three <laughs> times. He's got three reasons, he, and they're all pretty good. Um, but then God finally, the gift of the divine name is then sort of the thing that takes it over the top. Now, Catherine, you've talked to, uh, in past podcasts about your Jewish uh, doctoral father, John Jonathan Levinson. So the divine name, this is a point of controversy sometimes between Christians and Jews. How, so how should Christians approach the divine name in your opinion. Do you mean how to translate it or do you mean how to uh, Do we it? say it? Is it spoken? Do we oh, say the oh, Lord oh, or see. the name? Yeah. Uh, what does it mean? So, um, yeah, I, I do not 
pronounce the divine name uh, out of respect for Jewish um, believers, uh, our brothers and sisters uh, in faith in the Jewish community. Uh, I remember one t- one time um, I was sitting in class with Professor Levinson, and uh, a, a student said the divine name, and Levinson said only half jokingly. I am going to move away from you so that the lightning doesn't strike me as well. <laughs> so there's this custom, I'm sure many of our hearers or viewers uh, know about it, where uh, observant Jews will not say uh, this name. Now, uh, some Christians do. Uh, Brueggemann famously often uses the name. Always. W- always uses it. Yeah. And I understand why. I mean, to use to use the name uh, kind of personalizes instead of saying God or the Lord. But I I think out of respect, it's really best to avoid that. Uh, and honestly, we don't know how the name was pronounced anyway. Our, you know, no. the, our best guess is, and I will say it right now, Yahweh. That's our best guess. That's the name that everybody uses. Uh, but we don't really know. We we don't know uh, how, how the name was pronounced because it was so holy, considered so holy, that when vowel points were put into the Hebrew text, there were uh, the vowel points put under this holy name were the the vowel points for the word Adonai, meaning my Lord. And so, when an observant Jew comes to this name, uh, when when reading the text, uh, they will uh, they will say either. Adonai, meaning the Lord, or they will say Hashem, meaning the name, right? Uh, so I think it, it's just uh, it's just a good practice not to say it uh, out of respect. However you pronounce it, though, uh, as we can see in verse uh, 14, uh, the, the name uh, uses it comes from the root for to be, haya in Hebrew, meaning to be. So uh, I think I am who I am is a, is a fine translation. I will be who I will be. I am who I, I, I am being who I am being. It's, it can be uh, translated different ways. I think I am who I am is, is a fine translation though. And of course, I would, the Gospel of John picks it up too, I am. Go ahead. I would add that some Jews uh, including an acquaintance of mine, uh, a local here, Joe Edelheit, uh, even objects to that. That uh, so in the Ob- I think objects in the to Tana- saying I am or I am uh, to translating it at all because it's uh, ambiguous. And uh, so I think the Tanakh, the Jewish uh, translation, just says et ya, Esher et ya, or et ya. Excuse me. I'd have to. I'd, I have to read the Hebrew. I'm stumbling all over myself. But okay. anyway, just just to recognize that. But here we have the name of Jesus, and it is so in the, the, the Mark verse that is with this, Jesus says, as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You know, that is uh, the God of the living. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah. so we can use the name Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or simply Jesus, and so let's talk about why God gives us God's name. To call a con- to to use that name properly in prayer, praise, thanksgiving, repentance, evangelism. Yeah, and think about, you know, when you know someone's name, even today you have something of a claim on them, right? If I say joy, you will probably turn your head and look at me, right? If if you're not if you're doing something else, right? Or Rolf there's there's a there's a there's a there's a kind of vulnerability in giving someone your name right a kind of uh at least approach to intimacy though uh that so for god to give god's name uh to moses is a, another step in that relationship right this is the same god the god of abraham the god of isaac the god of jacob right we already know this god moses already knows this god the people of israel already know this god uh, through the patriarchs, but now God takes it to a new level by giving them God's own name so that they have even more of a claim on God. And that, of course, is why we get the the, the second commandment, right? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, uh, because there's, there's a kind of power there uh, of knowing the name of God. And you're going to, the, 
Moses is being sent back um, to Egypt where there are many gods. Uh, and um, the specificity of being able to say, um, not the God of my grand my ancestors, but my God. I've been in conversation with this God. This God who has given me his name is telling me to tell you to let his people go. And um, so it, it's, um, it's a very intimate, very powerful claim. And so that commandment becomes critical because if naming God, the creator, uh, the most high, um, becomes frivolous in the hands of a humanity that always does what we're prohibited for doing, it, it becomes a very important word to tell us, don't use this one lightly. It is a powerful name. And uh, I think that becomes the, um, the connection when we say uh, the name of Jesus. Um, mm -hmm. The power, there's power in the name of Jesus. Oh, what a beautiful name it is.